morning, church family. It's so good to be with you today. My name is Desiree. I am Pastor Anthony's wife and also here to help you, lead you, and to worship uh, to our King. And we're just so excited to serve you in this way. I know it's through video, but in this season that we're in, you know, circumstances and limitations are, are present. And, you know, we're trying to do our, our very best just to give you our very best. So um, as I'm out here um, in front of the camera leading worship, you know, Pastor Anthony is uh, behind the camera making sure that all these things are going smoothly and recording for you. And, you know, with the limitations that he has, he's going to use it for you. So be blessed. Know that we love you all so much and we can't wait to fellowship with you soon. Um, so will you please stand and join me as we praise our King. over the mountains.
Jesus. Jesus, name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Great 
your love was greater What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a wonderful name Death could not hold you, they tall before you, you silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, praise of your glory, for you Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that you've given us the ability to praise you, Lord, um, just with our hearts, Lord, with our voices. And Father, we are just so in awe of you, of just being our Lord, our Savior, our rock. We are so excited, Lord, to open your word. We thank you that we get to do so freely, and we have a place and a time, Lord. You're so good to us. And Father, I pray that you would magnify yourself now. Have your way, Lord. We love you so much. In Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Well, good morning, Calvary Chapel, Panama City Beach. Nice to be with you this morning. Uh, we are bringing you a special message that is just for you this morning. So, Calvary Chapel Crossover is not here with us. We're coming to you uh, from our home studio. And uh, we have a very special message for you this morning that I hope will minister to you. Uh, it is out of John chapter 10. If you'd like to turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 10. And my message titled this morning is The Shepherd and His Sheep. The Shepherd and His Sheep. John chapter 10, and we'll be looking at verse 11. So as you're turning to John 10, verse 11, you also might want to put a marker in Psalm 23 as we're looking at uh, Jesus, the good shepherd. Uh, those of you who know your Bibles well might understand why we would go to Psalm 23 as a part of the study this morning. So we're just so blessed to uh, be ministering to you this morning. Hey, Anthony has been having some real victories in his health. So I want to encourage us to keep praying for Pastor Anthony. And uh, now is a good time to really be praying and praying in faith 
pray in faith that God is going to touch him, God is going to minister to him, God is going to restore him. The Bible says the prayer of faith shall save the sick. So let's just put our trust in the Lord and believe that God is going to uh, be restoring him to his full health. And so um, be encouraged that he, his, he has, in fact, been, been having some great victories recently. And we're very excited about that. So let's pray now as we begin our message this morning. Father, we do thank you that Jesus is the good shepherd. And we are thankful, Lord, that we are your sheep. We are the sheep of your pasture. We're the sheep of your hand. Lord, we pray for Pastor Anthony and Desiree and their family that you will continue, Lord, to strengthen Anthony and to raise him up. We thank you for your touch of healing that you are bringing in his life. We thank you for it, Lord. We pray it in faith. And we ask, Lord, that you will minister to us this morning through your word, by the power of your spirit. We ask that you will minister to us, Lord, concerning your goodness. We thank you for these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says these words. He says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is here revealing uh, himself uh, in this way that he is the good shepherd. And of course, we are the sheep of his pasture. Now, what is significant about Jesus revealing himself as the good shepherd is the way that he does it here in John chapter 10, verse 11. Basically, the, the phrase can be broken into three parts. The first two words where Jesus says, I am. Then the third word, which says, the. And then the last phrase there, the good shepherd. It's broken into three parts. I am the good shepherd. Now, those words, just as they are, just reading them and hearing them, they're a great blessing that Jesus is the good shepherd. But as we look at it more closely, uh, there's even more blessing that emerges. For instance, when Jesus uh, speaks of himself as I am the good shepherd, he is referencing himself back to Exodus chapter 3, where God in the, uh, the burning bush passage reveals himself to Moses as the I am. God gives Moses his name and God gives him his name in the form of I am. Now, uh, you remember that as God called Moses to uh, go to Egypt and be the deliverer for the children of Israel, God said, I have seen the affliction of my people. I am going to deliver them. And Moses, I'm sending you to do it as my servant. And so Moses and God, you remember, went back and forth quite a bit as Moses was hesitant to um, accept that responsibility because it was an impossible task. God loves to do impossible things. Nothing is impossible with the Lord. Amen. And so as Moses and God sort of went back and forth and, and Moses was expressing his hesitancy, one of the things he said was, is, Lord, when I go to the children of Israel and I say to them that the God of our fathers has appeared to me and has sent me to you, suppose they should ask me, well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And that's when God in Exodus 3 verse 14 said to Moses, Moses, tell them I am has sent me to you. I am that I am has sent me to you. And so that is uh, the name of the Lord there. I am. Uh, it could also be translated uh, the becoming one. And the idea there is that God was pledging to the Israelites that God would become all that they would need as their deliverer. God would become their deliverer and free them from Egypt. Then God would become the one, for instance, who would supply the bread that they would need to sustain them, the manna from heaven. God would supply the water that they would need to drink. God brought water for the Israelites out of the rock. God would uh, be the one who would provide their guidance with the cloud that covered them by day 
and, and the fire of the cloud uh, by night. Um, God would be their defender, and God would bring them to the land that he had promised to their fathers, as God promised the land of Canaan to uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. So God was going to be everything that they would need. And so God revealed himself to Moses as the I am. I am the Lord. And so the name of God there. So Jesus, in the Gospel of John, uses the, the words I am in seven specific instances where he attaches who he is to the name of God revealed there in Exodus chapter 3. So here Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Uh, Later on, Jesus will say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Earlier here in the chapter in John, Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. And so there are seven instances where where Jesus connects himself to the name of God in, in Exodus chapter 3, the I am. So this is, this is the first part of this uh, phrase which uh, emerges uh, in a spectacular way. I am, and then secondly, the word the. I am the good shepherd. Jesus is not one among many good shepherds. Oh no, oh no. Jesus is the good shepherd. And as a matter of fact, there is none other besides him. God has given mankind a good shepherd, but there is only one, and that is his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The psalmist in Psalm 73 uh, expressed the uniqueness of, of God alone, right? being the one that he needs. Uh, The psalmist in Psalm 73 said, Who have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So here the psalmist, Who have I in heaven but you? Because the psalmist understood, You are the good shepherd and there is none besides you. And there is none upon the earth, the psalmist said, that I desire besides you. Truly, God is the good shepherd, and he has come to us in Jesus Christ, and there is none other besides him. You know, we can safely entrust our lives to Jesus Christ, because he is the good shepherd. There are many people in this world that we love and trust, and that's a good thing. But the ultimate place of safety for our heart and our life is with the good shepherd, and there is only one, and that is Jesus Christ. If you have yet to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today would be a great day to turn your life over to him because he will take care of you. He is the good shepherd, he and he alone. So first Jesus says, I am. Then he says, I am the. And then he uh, uh, describes himself there as the good shepherd. Jesus is not just the shepherd, but he is the good shepherd. God is good. Amen. Jesus is good. The Bible says that there's no shadow of turning with the Lord. That means there's no, you know, uh, dark side to the Lord. There's no, you know, it's like, well, he's happy most of the time, but he gets a little grumpy. God's not that way. God is good and he is good all of the time. The Bible speaks of his goodness in Psalm 73, uh, where the psalmist said, truly, God is good. The Bible speaks of God's goodness over and over in phrases like that he is righteous in all of his ways. 
Everything God does is right, and everything that God does is good. Jesus is the good shepherd. You know, David had a sense of the shepherding aspect of God. Amen? David knew the Lord as the good shepherd, and he expresses his understanding of God in this way in Psalm 23. So if you'd like to turn with me over to Psalm 23, we'll look at David's understanding of the Lord being the good shepherd. Psalm 23. So David says there, the Lord is my shepherd. David was a believer. David was one of God's sheep. He was converted to the Lord, as we've been reading about in the book of Acts, repent and be converted. David was a convert. He was a believer. And thus he had the Lord as his shepherd. And then David now will go through the rest of the psalm. It's only six verses describing the good shepherd's tender care of his sheep. And so in describing the Lord is my shepherd, the first thing that David says in verse one is, I shall not want. What this uh, what David is trying to say to us here in that David says, I shall not want, is that David knows that God is going to take good care of him. You know, God takes good care of his people. David understood that he would not be neglected. Because the Lord is his good shepherd. A good shepherd doesn't neglect his sheep. A good shepherd takes care of his sheep. And so God does take care of our lives. He really does. He watches over us and he takes care of us. If you have yet to become a believer, hey, listen, there is a whole measure of goodness and the care of God that you have yet to enter into. You know, God takes care of the world in general. We all have the sun rising over us. We all have rain for water. God provides food for us to eat. But there is a special and a specific and a tender care that God takes of those who are converted and believe in Jesus Christ and follow him. Uh, He is our savior. He is our shepherd and God uh, is uh, faithful uh, to care for us, and our lives are never neglected. But we have someone who is greater than us and higher than us, who is watching over us. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Next in verse 2, David says that he makes me to lie down in green pastures. So, Think of a sheep here. David is talking about the relationship of the shepherd to the sheep. And the sheep are, you know, we we just went on vacation. That's why we're giving you a special message. We didn't teach at our church on Sunday. So we're coming to you with a special message. Uh, uh, And so uh, when we were on our vacation driving up the five here in California, uh, we saw a lot of cows. Uh, We could smell the cows before we could see them. Uh, But we saw, you know, sheep and we saw goats and we saw green pastures. We saw sheep grazing in in the fields there and also laying down. And, you know, when you look at a sheep that is lying down in a green pasture, you say to yourself, that's a happy sheep. That's a blessed sheep. That's a contented sheep. Uh, That sheep has everything that it needs. He's lying down. And he's in a green pasture. He has all the food that he wants. It's all around him. And so the idea here that the Lord makes me to lie down in green pastures is the idea of rest and peace. He makes me to lie down, rest, rest. You know, the Bible teaches us rest in the Lord. Trust also in him. Because God is working things out. Resting in the Lord. I believe it's Psalm 73. Do not fret because of evildoers. Rest in the Lord. Trust also in him. Commit your way to the Lord, right? And he shall bring it to pass. God is good. 
And as his sheep, he causes us to rest and to be in a place of peace. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. I am the good shepherd. My peace I give to you. Paul told the Philippians, you know, Paul realizes the struggles of life. Paul says, listen, guys, in Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, the good shepherd. I added the good shepherd part, but the, the peace of God, shall the the peace of god which surpasses all understanding it's because we realize god is in control I, he wants me to lie down here in this green pasture of his care the peace of god which surpasses all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds through christ jesus he makes me to lie down in green pastures then in verse 2 he continues by saying he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Now, why this is significant, being led by still waters, is that sheep don't like rushing streams. They don't like the noise of the water rolling over the rocks. It, it troubles them. They hear the sound of it and they're thirsty. So, you know, the shepherd's trying to lead them you know, to a rushing stream, and it scares the sheep, the sound of the water. It bothers them, scares them. So David says, you know, our good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, what does he do? He leads us beside the still waters, where the water is flowing gently, where the sheep are not afraid, where the, the sheep can come and drink and have peace. And thus David says, he restores my soul. When, when you are thirsty and you need a drink, and, and as a sheep you're led to that still water, you drink and you become refreshed. We've been looking at in the book of Acts, haven't we, how uh, times of refreshment come from the presence of the Lord. And so our good shepherd, Jesus Christ, he leads us beside the still waters. I mean, I have these images in my mind. I, I, I would imagine you do too. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. The place of refreshment, the place of uh, my soul being restored. And then at the end of verse three, it says that he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, David is going to go from sort of uh, imagery of the shepherd and his sheep, which we have been looking at. And, and David is then going to now begin to look of it in terms of his own personal life, human existence. And so he speaks here of how the good shepherd leads him in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's obviously not speaking about sheep. Have you ever seen an unrighteous sheep? Uh, so he's applying it more to human terms. And the idea here is David understands that God is going to lead him, that God is going to lead him in the right way, both in personal holiness, right? He leads me in paths of righteousness to do what is right, to, to walk before him in a way that is pleasing. But also, he leads me in the right path. And so this is a promise of the Lord who is faithful to guide us throughout our life. God is faithful to guide us. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Then coming to verse four, a very familiar verse, uh, even secular movies will uh, have a, a preacher uh, quoting this verse in, in a, a scene where uh, it's a memorial service. David says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So David here is perhaps thinking of uh, when he will depart from this earth 
and, and go home to be with the Lord. And he speaks of walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But in that place, David's heart instructs him as he says, I will fear no evil. He says, this is why he said, for you are with me. The presence of the Lord is, a, is there to be a comfort to all of God's people. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, he says, they comfort me. The presence of the Lord to comfort his people. The presence of the Lord to comfort his people. You know, interesting, he speaks here of the rod and the staff. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What David means by that is that when a shepherd is with the sheep, oftentimes the tap of the rod uh, uh, that the sheep can feel, his shepherd's staff, the tap of the rod gives comfort to the sheep that the shepherd is there. They're aware of his presence. And David says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me, knowing God that you are there comforts me. You know, guys, I, I want to just share this with you that one of the greatest ways that the Lord reveals his presence to me, one of the greatest ways that I feel that tap of the shepherd's staff is through personal devotions in the word of God. And I want to encourage you, if you have yet to develop this in your life, have a personal devotional time with God in the Bible. It must come through the, the Word of God. You know, the, the devotionals are very helpful. I enjoy devotionals, but I always go to devotionals after the Word because the Word is where I feel the rod and the staff. The, the Word is where I come to the awareness that the Lord is with me. Now, I know the Lord is with me. I already believe in the Word, but as I'm meditating in the word, the presence of the Lord becomes something that I experience. It's, it's something that I am brought into in a greater awareness. So I want to encourage us as a church. Let's have personal devotions in the word of God on a daily basis if we can. If you don't know how to get started... Just start in the Gospel of Matthew. Get a marker. Open your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. Put your marker there. And read as much of Matthew as you're comfortable reading at that sitting. Maybe it'll be a chapter. Maybe it'll be more. But just read the Word. And wherever you finish, then just put your marker there. And the next day, make a commitment to come back to that very same place Open your Bible, pull your marker out, and continue reading in Matthew. And just go from Matthew and just say, I'm going to read till I get to Revelation. And when I finish Revelation, then I'll, I'll, I'll figure out what I'm going to do next. But you will experience your good shepherd in a very powerful way. And the experience of him grows. The awareness of his presence. It, it's something... In my life, this is the way I experience my good shepherd the most frequently. I experience it, of course, in church, in prayer, in worship, in fellowship, in ministering and serving and doing different things. But being in the word of God, this is where the presence of the Lord fills my soul so consistently. And I, I want you to have the same experience because I'm an under shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. I'm an under shepherd and I want you to know all of the goodness of the Lord that I experience and I hope that you do. And so, you know, we love you church and and we want to we we want to pour into you and see you blessed and built up. So this is a way to experience the rod and the staff, the presence of the Lord, the comfort of God through being in his word. Well, I got to keep moving. Verse 5, uh, David says, You prepare a table before me 
in the presence of my enemies. That is, God makes a way for his people that is not known to his enemies. God makes a way for his people that is not known to his enemies. The picture is this. David is in a place. His enemies are around. They're around, right? But the Lord is with David. And what is the Lord doing? The Lord is setting a table before David. Think of setting the table for an Easter afternoon or think of setting a table for a Thanksgiving dinner. The tablecloth, the china, the the centerpiece, the, the, the food that is brought out. David's like, you know what? My enemies are around, but God is setting a table for me to dine at. There is a way that God makes for his people that is not known to his enemies. We have that as, as the sheep of the Lord. I could, I could, go, I could say more, but I'm, as, a, as a halfway decent shepherd, I, I'm going to try and keep moving for you. Um, David says next in verse 5, You anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. You know what this is about? In the Middle East, during this time, when you would go under someone's roof, you are invited to their house, you come into their home, um, you've heard of the washing of the feet that would take place, but oftentimes, the owner of the home, as they would greet you into their house, they would also take a little bit of oil, and they would put a little bit of oil on your head. It it was fragrant oil, similar uh, to perfume, but they would anoint you. It's sort of like a way of saying, I welcome you into my home and I love you. I appreciate you. You are welcome here. Let me not only wash your feet, but let me anoint your head with a little bit of oil. And so this is what David is, is talking about here. You anoint my head with oil. You know this, church? Do you know this? God likes you. You know that? God likes you. You know that he loves you, but God also likes you and he welcomes you into fellowship with him. As a matter of fact, the majority of the Bible, the message is beckoning God's people to come to him or beckoning the unbelievers to turn and believe and to come to him. You know, God likes you. He appreciates you. He enjoys you. And so as someone who would anoint your head with oil as you would come under their roof. So God, in the same way, welcomes you into his fellowship in his home. David, considering all these things, says at the end of verse 5, he says, you know what? My cup runs over. My cup runs over. David is like, I am not only full of your blessings, but Lord, my, your blessings are overflowing. My cup runs over with your goodness. And so, you know, God, God in his goodness, he doesn't just give us a full cup. God gives us an overflowing cup. God pours his blessings in and they overflow. God is good. And so the good shepherd and his sheep, my cup runs over, David says. And then finally in verse six, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely, this is David saying confidently, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Of course, goodness is going to follow David. Why? Because he's under the care of the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Someone illustrated this like a person having two, two little dogs. And, uh, you know, as they're out on a walk, you know, there's goodness and mercy. The two little dogs just right at your heels following you along. And every time you turn around, there they are, goodness and mercy. And so David is confident. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Guys, we are underneath the care 
of the good shepherd. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. You know, quickly, as you survey David's life, not every day of David's life was easy. Not every season of David's life was, could be described as comfortable and pleasant. Yet, as we consider the life of David as a whole, we see the activity of God in every part. We see that truly God was David's good shepherd from beginning to end. And so we realize it is true God's goodness and God's mercy does follow us all the days of our life. May we put our faith and trust in him. And David says, last of all, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, this life, we've got the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. But when we leave this earth and go into the next life, what awaits us there? Well, there, David says, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The best is yet to come. I mean, we have the good shepherd here and now. But when this life is over, then we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We are going to enter glory and we are going to see God face to face and be with him forever and ever and ever. So the shepherd and his sheep. Now listen, the, the things of God's goodness and God's blessing, they're not automatic for every person in the world. The, the message of the Bible is that God's shepherding care comes to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. These blessings are for those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Have you made that decision? Let me put it to you in a different way. Have you been converted? Do you consider yourself a convert to Jesus Christ? These blessings God has in his heart for you, but you must be converted. That is, you must make a decision to believe in Jesus Christ that he is God's son. And you must make a decision that you're going to turn from the life that you've been living to a life of faith in Jesus Christ and seeking to follow him. If you will be willing to make that decision, God will bring you into his sheepfold and you will be one of his sheep. God will forgive you of your sins and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is how, through faith in Jesus Christ, because Jesus went to the cross and he died there for the sins of the world. And as you put your faith in Jesus Christ, your sins will be forgiven because of the death that he died for uh, the world on the cross there. So as we are going to close now in prayer, I'm going to give you an opportunity if you would like to ask Jesus to come into your life. If you would like to become a believer today, if you'd like to be converted today and have God as your shepherd, if you would like to know that your sins are forgiven and that you'll go to heaven when you die, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray and settle that with God. Uh, it, it's something that needs to take place in your life if it hasn't yet. And so as we close in prayer now, I'm going to give you an opportunity if you would like to make that decision the choice is yours, but if you'd like to make that decision, I will give you an opportunity. So with every head bowed, all eyes closed, and nobody really looking around, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, that you are a good, actually the good shepherd of the sheep. We are so grateful, Lord, to be under your care. Father, we ask if there be any among us today that have yet to make their peace with you, that have yet to uh, be born again and put their faith in Jesus Christ, we pray that you will help them to pray now and to uh, ask you into their life. Give them faith, Lord. Give them courage to pray and receive you into their life. With every head bowed and all eyes closed, nobody looking around, 
If you'd like to pray and make your peace with God today and be converted as a believer in Jesus Christ, then repeat these words after me. Repeat this prayer as I say it. Repeat these words to God and he will hear you. Say these words now. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are the Son of God. And I ask that you will come into my life now. I ask that you will forgive me for my sins, for I have sinned against you. I ask for your forgiveness this day. I pray that you will help me to know you. I pray that you'll help me to follow you. And I pray that I will go to heaven when I die. And I thank you for these things. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. All right, well, if you prayed that prayer this morning, there are some folks at the church that would just uh, love to know about that, some leaders there. Um, if we can give you a Bible to send you on your way with the Bible, we don't want anything from you. We just want to know that you made a decision to become a believer and encourage you uh, in that decision today. I'd like to just pray for us as a church Heavenly Father, as, well, as a matter of fact, sorry to interrupt the prayer. Let's stand together, shall we? Let's stand together and we'll close uh, in a prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Calvary Chapel, Panama City Beach. I thank you, Lord, for your loving care over the flock in PCB. Lord, we pray in faith for the healing of the sick, including Pastor Anthony, Lord, and any others that need a touch, we thank you for your touch upon the lives of your people, Lord. God, help us to just carry this message with us through the week and to realize that you are good. May we be thankful. May we worship you. May we take our place of rest in that uh, uh, field of green, Lord as we have the confidence that you're watching over our lives. Thank you so much, God. We worship you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, God bless you, church. We look forward to seeing you soon. We will be with you uh, beginning July 11th, and uh, we're looking forward to the various ways we're going to get together. We're going to fellowship. We're going to worship God. We're going to seek him and have some time face to face with one another. It's going to be wonderful. So until then, uh, may the Lord richly bless you and uh, we will see you next Sunday.